So I do want to point out that uh, this whole cheat.sh website was brought to my attention by a viewer whose name was Pseudobase. So thank you, Pseudobase. He uh, brought this up in uh, my tutorials on bringing weather information to your display in your shell. So again, thank you, Pseudobase, for bringing this website to my attention because I think it's really cool. Uh, and as always, I hope that you guys have a great day. Okay, and welcome to 2018. This video is the beginning of a series for my shell script tutorials in 2018. I've done many shell scripts in the past over the years, but this is the series I'm doing in 2018. We're going to learn a lot this year. Be sure to check out the full playlist in the link in the description or at the end of this video. Again, this will be the first. I'll be releasing a bunch over the coming weeks. So let's go ahead and quickly jump into the shell. If you've used the shell at all, well, something that's very useful are man pages, manual pages. And so you can type in man and the... Uh, command you want to know about. So in this case, like ls is for listing directories, you can hit man ls, and then you can go through here and look at all your options for that program. Q to get out of that. Uh, you can also do something like make dir, and it will give you the instructions, the manuals for that. Uh, or something like bc, which has a very long man page with a lot of stuff in here. Um, and I always say a good man page will always have examples, but sadly, a lot of man pages don't have any examples on how the commands work. So, how can you find commands? Of course, you can go and Google this command and see some examples, but there's actually a website right here called cheat.sh. And it's very simple to use up here at the top. You can click this little box up here and type in the command or click the drop down to see a full list. And you can see they have lots of commands uh, in here already with some cheat sheets. So in here, I can type in ls and hit enter. And it'll give us some very quick examples on the ls command that you can play with. Or we can go uh, make dir, and you can see some examples of that. Or bc. And if you were to type in part of a command, so let's say I type in dir, it's going to say, oh, did you mean dirs, make dir, remove dir, and you go, oh, yeah, 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 I wanted uh, remove dir. And it will give you some examples on that. Uh, and you can even do things like sed, and it will give you some examples on sed or awk. Lots of just a few examples that you can copy and paste. But again, we're doing this in the web browser. We're working in the shell. Maybe we don't have a web browser. Not a problem. Of course, if you look right here, it tells you exactly what the command is. And if we go back to our home directory on this website, you can see it tells you right here, show the show a cheat sheet. I do uh, curl the website and forward slash command. And it's going to output. So in here, I can say um, curl cheat.sh forward slash ls and it gives us the same examples or make dir or sed or even awk and you can of course copy and paste these examples so here this last example in awk is uh specify an output separator for characters so let's say we had this input of one two three with spaces well we can say well let's in between each one of those numbers i need a semicolon that's exactly what this command does here we can do that so very quick and easy to see commands, some examples for them. Examples are great. It's going to save you some Googling. And, you know, man pages are great to get the details. But if you just want to see how a program works, it's nice to have a command you can copy and paste and go, oh, okay, I got an idea on how this works. Instead of trying to go, oh, okay. So I say semicolon begin and then OFS. And then, uh, you know, it's easy to have an example right there. And it's a quick and easy way to do it. You can look at it in the web browser, you know, on your phone or your desktop. But again, you can do the same exact thing in your shell without leaving it. You can use curl, or though I'm sure uh, that if we were to use wget with um, dash q for quiet and capital O dash for standard output, we get the same thing. Let's clear the screen to make that a little cleaner. There we go. So you can use wget if that's all you got. Uh, it's one of those things. Uh, I love curl. I think it's a little more advanced than wget, but wget's on pretty much every Linux system. Even if you're working on a router or something, it's just there because it's built into things like BusyBox. So it's nice to know how to both work. 
So there you go. I do thank you for watching. Again, this is part of a series. I hope that you stick around for us and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the rest of the series. Um, if you're waiting for more videos come out in the series, I still I have hundreds of shell script tutorials. Just check out my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There's a link in the description there. You can search through all my videos from this channel and my other channel. If you enjoy my videos, definitely think about becoming a supporter over at patreon.com uh, forward slash melx1000. Or if you go to the support section on my website, you can also support me through PayPal. I do thank you for watching. Uh, and I hope you like, share, comment, subscribe, all that stuff, because it really does help. I appreciate it, and I hope that you have a great day. Okay, and welcome to this second video in this series on uh, shell script. Now, I'm going to show you a shell command here, uh, but we're going to be talking about using it for uh, other programming languages, if that makes sense. So, bear with me. So, last time I was telling you about a website called uh, cheat.sh, and I showed you how you could use it in the shell, do it using curl, uh, cheat.sh, and name a command like uh, make dir, and it will give you some examples of how that command could work. Uh, well, there's other options here, again, they show you on the website, and again, you can bring this up without going to your web browser, just by doing that, it's going to tell you the same information that's on the website, which is nice that they format it like that. Um, and here, we're going to look at other options, and we can, you can see that we have other languages, programming languages that you can use. So, for example, they have programming options for PHP or Perl or Python or C++ or examples we're going to look at today just as examples. So again, we're going to use curl and then we're going to say cheat.sh and this time instead of forward slash name of the command, we're going to say forward slash and a programming language. So we can say C++ if we hit enter. Um, what did I do wrong here? Oh, maybe the C++ part. Oh, of course, it would help if I spelt things properly. So it seems like uh, cheer.sh is available if anyone wants that domain. Anyway, here we go. So the program engine C++, it gives you a quick description of it. Uh, and it tells you, you know, it's widely used by these companies. It tells you how a compiler could work. And if you execute that, the output would be this. And then it gives you some options here on list, learn, uh, for, you know, onward. Um, so... For example, real quick, if we wanted to search how arrays work, uh, so we could go curl uh, cheat.sh forward slash c++ forward slash arrays, and we can hit enter. And there you will give you an example of how arrays work in c++. And if I was to type part of that, so let's say I was just to type ar, it's going to give us an example. Oh, it's going to give us, okay, so there's a command that says start, because it has ar there in the middle. There's also arrays, and then there's the learn um, option here. What we're going to do here is we can also go colon list and we'll list out all of the um, examples it has for that programming language so you can use any of these. So like hello, let's go ahead and, and give that a try. So here we'll just type in hello and it's going to give us a basic hello world for C++ example here. And of course, like I said, you could use other programming languages. So if we were to come in here and type in whoops, Python it's going to give us a brief summary of Python. And quickly here, it shows you how to even start a web server, uh, whether you're working with Python 3 or Python 2.7. Uh, and again, just like previously with C++, we can type in colon list, whoops, colon list, and it'll give us a list of options here that we can look at. Why did it bring up Perl stuff? Did I type something wrong there? Oh, because I forgot to type Python. So that's listing all the different languages there. I was going to show you that next. <laughs> but Python, forward slash, colon, list. And it'll list just the Python. It doesn't have a whole lot of examples here. But enough to get you started. Again, you can do um, hello. And it'll give you a basic hello world uh, for Python. Maybe they'll add more things later. Obviously, like I showed you last time, there are a whole lot of uh, commands that it have, has listed just for your basic shell interface. Um, but... 
Uh, it has a few examples for different programming languages here, so print hello world would be your example. Uh, of course, that's Python uh, 2 point whatever there. It does tell you how to install it, like uh, if you're on a Debian or Ubuntu system, or if you're on uh, Fedora or CentOS. Anyway, so I just want to show you that the cheat.sh website gives you more than just your basic shell commands and programs you can use in the shell, but it gives you a few examples right now for other programming languages. And again, if we were to just do curl cheat.sh and colon list, it'll give us a list of um, different options. So you have different shells here. If you want to look at bash shell or Z shell, which is what I'm currently using, fish, you got some Emac examples. Uh, so these are different commands, I guess you could say, to bring up uh, information on those things. And then uh, again, uh, up here, we have different programming languages, Lua, Perl, C++. You know, this is just listing out everything that it has a list for. And then you can get up at the top here into commands uh, for your shell. Uh, that's pretty much it. Again, like I showed you last time, you can use wget. I would use the Q for quiet so you don't see the output of wget. Capital O dat and dash will say standard output instead of putting it in a file. Otherwise, it would put it into a file. Uh, and cheat.sh forward slash. And again, we'll say awk. And it will give you the output for awk or said. So whether you want to use curl or wget, both display properly here in your shell. And of course, you can always go to the website. Uh, and there's a few other things that this website does, but that's the, basically what I wanted to show you. I do thank you for watching. If you enjoy these uh, videos, be sure to check out my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There's a link in the description of the video. There you can go to the support section and support me through PayPal or through Patreon, patreon.com forward slash melx1000. Uh, you appreciate all support. You can also search through all my videos at my website from both my channels, uh, this software channel. I also have a hardware channel. I do thank you for watching. It really does help if you like, share, subscribe, and comment. So if you do enjoy this video, please do those things for me. And I hope that you have a great day. Hello and welcome. This is video three in my 2018 uh, shell script tutorials for your Linux shell. Let's go ahead and look at the stat command. So let's say, you know, if I was to list out here, I've got a folder with a couple of uh, video files in it, a couple of subfolders there from Christmas Day. And uh, let's say I wanted to get information about it. I could do uh, list space dash L for list, H for human readable, A for um, all, I believe, because it will show hidden files as well. There's no hidden files in here, but I tend to, that's just how I type it by default. Uh, so here we go, you know, you got information on permissions for a file. Um, I forget what the second column is here. Uh, probably file type. These are probably files. These are probably directories, something like that. Uh, don't, no, no, that's what this is for. I forget what the second column is. Anyway, uh, let's say I wanted to know uh, the user or the group that owns these files. Uh, I could do that and let's say I just wanted the user of a file. I could uh, list out that file. Let's say I want to go with this file, this this Christmas morning one uh, dot AVI. AVI. Uh, I could do that. That lists out that file. And then I could pipe that into awk and I can then say awk and I can say print dollar sign and I want column three so one two three yep I'll column three and there we go I can see that uh, the owner of that file is metal x1000 that's me uh, that's 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 you know running two commands and, and piping stuff and it, it's it's a bit longer than needed uh, so what I could do is I could use the stat command so I can just type in stat dash C and since I want the user I can say uh, percentage capital U here and the file name so Christmas morning AVI and right there, it gives me just the username. Now, we could look at the man file to learn more about the stat command. And here we go. You can see a list of options here. And you can see lowercase a is the access rights in octal, or capital A is access right in human readable form. So if we were to run the same command again, I can just do lowercase a. And it tells me right there that the permissions in octal are 644. Uh, you know, so that's. Uh, one way, but you can also do capital A, and you can see that it is, you know, for the user, it's readable and writable. For everybody else, it's readable. 
Um, and of course, you can put some of these together. Let's say I wanted to say the who the owner is, the user that owns that file. I can say percent capital U and then capital A, and yeah, I can see I get that it's the uh, that's the user, and these are the permissions here. And of course, I could should be able to reverse those as well. And there you go. Uh, actually, nope, I did A and A, didn't I? There we go. Okay, uh, so those are some examples. Let's look at uh, other options. Um, we could also use it to, uh, you know, get uh, links. So let's go ahead and go back in the man page here for stat. And we can scroll down here. And you can see a lot of options. You can see, you know, what file type it, it is. Uh, and uh, whether it's secure Linux security context string uh, going down. Uh, we can get just the file name if we want. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that you can get with the list command, but you can ask for specific parts of them without other information. So that way you don't have to grep and pipe and said just to get a piece of that information. It's just a little more efficient that way. Um, and here with the with the file name command, we can use that. Uh, we should be able to use that. Um, actually, let's look at this capital in here. Quote file name uh, with difference of symbolic link. So I have a symbolic link uh, in my uh, www folder. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say stat. And I'm going to say dash c. And here I'm going to say percent n. And then the link is inside my home folder uh, www media and I can hit enter and right there it tells me that this symbolic link is pointing to this directory here uh, so that's a quick easy way to just split things up and again look at the man page because there are a lot of options in here all listed right there and uh, again, it might save you some time, you know, some, some coding. You don't need to pipe stuff, which is the same system resources, and might shorten up your commands a little bit. And, and you can run this on uh, a full directory. So let's say we were to go back up to here. I can say, give me uh, the, you know, the permissions and the username for all files in this directory. And there you go. You get both of those. Uh, so that's it for this tutorial. So I hope that you find that useful. If you did, be sure to check out the rest of my videos in this playlist and my previous playlist. I've done hundreds of shell script tutorials over the years. Be sure to check them out on my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There's a link in the description there. You can quickly search through all my videos from both my channels. And uh, while you're there, check out the support section where you can support me through uh, PayPal or Patreon. I do uh, appreciate your support. Also, if you like my videos, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and comment. That stuff helps a lot. Uh, more views I get, the better, and I appreciate it, and I hope that you have a great day. Hello and welcome to video four in this series of 2018 Shell Script Tutorials. I hope you've checked out my previous videos in this series as well as videos I've done over the years because I've done hundreds on Shell Scripts. Today we're going to be looking at the make directory command, mkdir, uh, but we're going to combine that with the cd command. So for example, I am in an empty directory right now. You can see nothing in there. And I can say make directory my dir and I can move into that by typing cd my dir and you can see it's empty. But moving back out of that, I can remove that folder, make dir, and um, now I'm in an empty directory again. Lots of the time when you make a directory, the next thing you're probably going to do is move into it with CD. So if you do do that all the time, you might want to combine the commands. Okay, so uh, the first thing you want to do is come up with a name for your command. And there's different ways of doing this. I'm going to show you a very simple way today, uh, but in the next video, I'll show you a more complicated way that does a little bit of uh, uh, error checking if you want, if you, if you you know, if you want to call it that. Anyway, uh, let's create a command. Now, I was thinking originally MCD for make change directory. Problem is, 
that is actually a command on my machine already, mcd, so man mcd. And you can see it may not be installed on your system. It's part of the M tools, uh, which you use to work with uh, Microsoft DOS disks, which I have been working, doing stuff with uh, FAT32 partitions, which I'm going to be doing tutorials on in the near future. And that's why I have this. So you may not have that command installed, but it is the name of a command. So you may not want to use that because in the future you might install that and then you go to use it and you've already overwritten it, um, although it will still exist. Anyway. Uh, you come up with whatever name you want. In the next video, we're going to look at replacing uh, the MD, uh, M MKDIR command. But today, we're just going to create a new command, uh, and I'll just call it MyCD. Okay? So I'm going to call it MyCD, and then I'm going to give parentheses. So what, you, what does it mean when you have uh, parentheses like that in a command in pretty much any programming language? It's a function. We are creating a function here. Uh, so we're going to say that and we're going to give it our little squiggly braces there. And what we're going to do is we're going to give it two commands, make dir, mkdir, dollar sign one. And then we're going to say ampersand, ampersand, uh, cd, dollar sign one. And I'm going to do a semicolon, which I don't think needs to be there, but I like to have it there to let you know that that's the end. So basically what we're doing here is we're creating a function called mycd. And when you run that function, it's going to run this command and this command. So it's going to run make dir and, and cd. And then the ampersand ampersand says only move into that directory if this command is successful, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then the dollar sign one in both of these is the first string, the first uh, variable sent to the command. So we'll look into that more in a second. But let's just go ahead, hit enter. And now I can type in my CD and I can type in test one. And when I hit enter, it created that directory and moved me into it in one simple command. And I can move back out and I can say uh, MCD test two. And I moved into that directory. And if I rest run it again, now I'm in another directory inside that directory. So it's saving me from typing out a separate command. Now, if I was to back out of this and I was to run this command again, it's going to give me an error, but still move me into that directory. So if I hit enter here, it's going to say that that directory already exists. The file already exists because it already did uh, make CD and it did not move me into it. Now, depending on your scenario, you may or may not want you to move into it. So you're going to create a directory and move into it. It will give you this error unless you pipe it to dev null. Uh, if we were to rewrite our function, and instead of ampersand, ampersand, we just do semicolon, which is saying is run this command and then run this command, as opposed to run this command and if successful, then run this command. So now if I was to run this and I was to type in my CD2, it's going to tell me that file, that, that folder already exists, but it's still going to move me into it. You may or may not want, not want that for your thing. Now, there might be more reasons than one. This reason it could not successfully create the directory was because it existed. Maybe you can't create the directory because you don't have permissions to create the directory inside that directory. Uh, in, the, in which case, you'd get two fails. You get a fail that uh, you can't create it, and then you get a fail that you couldn't move into it. You decide what works best for you. Um, I think if the first one fails, it's a good idea to stop there. But again, up to you. Now, if I was to open up a new shell session, so down here, this is a new shell session down here like open up a new window or closing that one open it up and I was type in my CD you can see it says that it doesn't exist and it's going to my shell because the way I have Z shell set up it's going to suggest a change to me because that command does not exist it create it exists in this session up here my CD okay so the way you make that permanent you know, through all your sessions is it adds to your RC file so if you're using bash it's dot bash RC if you're using Z shell it's dot Z shell RC in your home directory I'm not going to get into that you probably already know how to do that if not Google it and I'm also pretty sure that I've done videos on that in the past another thing I want to show you is again this dollar sign is saying use the first variable pass to us so if we were to again my CD and type in test 4 it created that directory move into it but if I was to type in uh, my CD this is a folder, it's not going to create a folder called this is a folder. It's going to create a folder called this and ignore the rest of it. So you can see I'm in a folder called this. If you want it to create that entire folder, you're going to want to put quotations around that. And so there we create a folder called this is a folder and moved into it. You could change uh, your function to basically use all strings passed to it. That's one option. If you want to do that, I don't think that's necessarily a great idea. Plus, you might want to add other options to that. So that is a quick and simple way to make a directory and move into it in one command. So now I can mcd blah, 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 and 
I've created it and moved into it. I do thank you for watching. As always, I hope that you enjoyed this tutorial. Hope you enjoy all my tutorials. Please visit my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There's a link in the description. There you can search through all my videos. Also support me in the sports section at patreon.com forward slash melx1000 or through PayPal. So check that out on my website as well. And if you do like my videos and can't support financially, I do appreciate a like. Think about subscribing and sharing. Definitely helps. Uh, again, I thank you for watching and I hope that you have a great day. Hello and welcome. This video is part of a series. Be sure to check out the full playlist in the link in the description of this video, as well as the end of this video. Also check out all my previous shell videos. I've done hundreds over the years on the Linux shell, Bash shell, and other shells. Uh, and in the previous video, we looked at creating a command, a function such as this for our shell. Uh, basically, we're creating our, our new function uh, that makes a directory, and then if successful in creating that directory, we move into it. So. Uh, I can hit enter here and now I can say my dir123 and it create a directory called 123 and move me into it. If I move back out and I run that same command again, uh, we get an error that the file already exists and, or that, you know, the directory already exists and it does not move us into it. Um, today we're going to take that a step further. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in the previous video, I told you how you can put it inside your bash rc file to make it so that you can have this throughout multiple sessions. Um, first off, I want to say that you can also name this function mkdir, um, and that way you don't have to learn a new command. But if you're going to do that, uh, I would recommend doing it like so, just uh, to clarify in your code. If you would do it like this, so basically, this is telling it specifically to make sure you're using the command make dir and not the function that we're currently in. I think that if you leave that out, in most cases, it will probably work fine, but it's good practice to put that in there. But getting on to our bashrc file, I've created an if-then statement inside my bashrc file. So dot bashrc uh, right here. I put it at the top here just to get to it quickly. And I call it mkd. So basically, we're going to be doing the same thing, but Instead of just trying to create it, and if it's successful, move into it, we're going to check first, does that directory exist? So we're saying if this directory does not exist is actually what we're checking here. So we're saying uh, the exclamation mark says, if this is not true, check if this directory exists. So if it does not exist, we are going to make directory, make that directory, and if that's successful, move into it. Now, it can fail for multiple reasons. As I said in the previous video, it could fail because that file or that folder or file already exists or because you don't have permissions. But what we're checking here is, does it exist? So we're taking it a step farther and we're actually checking, does it exist? If it does not, create it and try to move into it. That still may fail if you don't have permissions. But here, if the file already does exist, we're going to output a message saying that the folder already exists, which you already kind of get from the make dir. But let's go ahead, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to save that. I'm going to go into my bash shell, and I'm going to say make123, which we just created. So it should tell me uh, that it cannot create the directory the file already exists. Oh, that's the make dr. Uh, my command was uh, mkd123. So you can see there's a difference. Mine gives you this output, which is from our if-then statement. Now, why would you want to do this? You're already getting that output from the uh, uh, make dir file, because in certain scenarios, if you can come up with something, it might be beneficial to have different checks for different problems, whether it's permissions or if the folder already exists. You may want to, which we're going to do here in a moment, just a theoretical example, uh, if that file already exists, create a new folder with that name and some sort of integer at the end or some other character. So a, a very basic example here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into my bash rc file. And in here, I'm going to say, yeah, you know, the folder already exists. And then I'm going to say creating that file underscore one instead. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this function itself. So I'm going to say mkd dollar sign one underscore. And if all goes well, I can exit out of this. 
I can go into bash again, because it's in my bash RC file. It doesn't automatically go into the session I'm in, because uh, the bash RC file runs when you start a new session. So I type bash here, and if I MDK, uh, MKD123 this time, if I typed everything properly, it says this file already exists, uh, and we are creating this instead, but it didn't create that. So I typed something wrong. It did create a folder with the underscore. Um, let's see. Then bash RC. Oh, because I didn't put the one there. There we go. Uh, so if we go back out, and now if I MKD123, it says 123 already exists, creating 123 underscore instead. Oh, I forgot to start a new bash session. Whoops. So let me do that real quick. So that might mistake. Hopefully that didn't confuse you too much. Uh, the changes, again, didn't take effect because I didn't start a new session. It's my bash RC file. So MKD123. Now I'm getting the results I wanted. Okay, so it's saying that 123 already exists and creating 123 underscore instead, and which it did, and it moved me into there. Now if I was to move back out, I can run that command again, mkd123, and this time it's going to tell me, oh, well, 123 already exists. We're going to try creating 123 underscore 1 instead, and then it says, oh, 123 underscore 1 already exists, and we're going to create 123 underscore un, uh, 1 underscore instead. Uh, you could probably come up with a better script to where it actually numbers it rather than putting an underscore 1 each time, uh, but every time I run that command, mkd123, it will go through the cycle of checking each one because it's calling upon itself. Again, you can make that a little bit better. I'm just doing it like a quick little basic example here for you. But I hope that I showed you a little bit something today. So let's review the three things we went over today. So we uh, added our command to our bash rc file, but not only did we add it to our bash rc file, we added to it and by having an if then statement that checks whether the directory exists. You can also have it check other things. Again, permissions and have it do something else or permissions, uh, or give different messages, whatever. It gives you a little more flexibility than our code from last time, which was very basic and worked, um, but this gives you more options. Again, um, if you were to want to um, create a function called mkdir, which is the original command, uh, that way you don't have to relearn the command, uh, it's a good practice to put command uh, DIR in there. So if I hit enter now, and you do want a space after the curly braces here. There we go. Uh, so now I can say make DIR123 and it creates, so I don't have to learn a new command. So it's up to you whether you want to have the um, uh, MKDIR command work like this or if you want to create your own command, that way they work independently of each other. And again, uh, the command here is just specifying that we're using the mkdir command and not this function, so it's not calling itself. Uh, so again, if you left that out, I uh, think it will still work, but it's good practice to have that there. Um, so that's it. We learned three things, putting in the bash rc file, our if then statement, and also the command command to make sure that we uh, uh, have the original command rather than the function we're calling. Uh, I you know I messed up once or twice in the middle there. Uh, let's just go back here and just as an example create another file. I'll call it uh, or folder. I'll call it folder. And if I move back out and try to run that again. Oh, right. MKD uh, folder. There we go. So instead of creating folder, which already existed, it created folder underscore one. Again, up to you in your scenario. I think in most cases I would prefer if it already exists to move into that folder, but that could cause problems if you do that because maybe you thought you just moved into a new directory, but you moved into a directory that already exists and all of a sudden you start messing with files that are in there without realizing you start overriding stuff. You might like try to cat or echo something into a file that you don't think exists and end up overriding it. Again, all your preferences. This is all about flexibility and doing what you need to accomplish. Anyway, I do thank you for watching. I hope you do enjoy these tutorials. Be sure to check out the link in the description to my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. There you can search through all my videos, and I've got plenty of them. You can also go to the support section on my page and support me through either PayPal or patreon.com forward slash millx1000. I do thank you for watching. If you do like these, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and comment. I hope that you have a great day.
Hello and welcome to this series on shell scripts. I hope you're enjoying this. Today we're going to be looking at how to find where certain commands are located. And if you work with the shell at all, you're probably familiar where the where with the where is command. I could type in something like where is nmap, and it will tell me right where the executable is. Any other files that might go along with it, such as the man file for the manuals. Another one I can do is where is, and I can say pwd and right here you can see that there is an executable pwd and there's a header file if you're programming in C you can use that and there's a man page as well but let's try another command where is and we'll try the read command the read command is a command that allows you to grab user input when we hit enter there it tells me where the man page for that is the files for the manual but it doesn't tell me where the executable is and that's because it is a built-in command uh, it's built into my shell which currently right now I'm at Z shell let's go ahead and uh, type in command dash capital V in the command command uh, you probably saw in a previous tutorial I did I briefly touched on it. it, does a few things like telling it to run an actual executable uh, rather than a built-in function, which we did in a previous video. But here with the dash capital V uh, switch, we can type in something like free, and it tells me where the executable is. But if we did one like read, it's going to tell me that it's built into the shell. Another one we can do is command uh, capital V, and we can do archive. Archive is actually a function that I created that is inside my Z shell RC file. So it will tell you whether it's a function. And if I was to create an alias, let's say I was to say I wanted to alias uh, the command year to date plus percent Y. Now anytime I type in year, it's just going to tell me what year it is. But if I command dash capital V, year it will tell me that year is an alias for this command so so far it will show us uh, where an executable binary is whether it's a built-in command whether it's a function within uh, like my RC file uh, or if it's a alias let me go ahead and clear the screen here real quick let's create a function right here in this session uh, let's say I wanted to create an epoch command uh, for getting Unix timestamps and I can just do in here date plus percent s. Now anytime I type in epoch, it's going to give me the number of seconds since 1970. Uh, so that's great. Now if I use command dash v and the epoch command, you can see that it's going to tell me that it is a shell function. Last time it told me with the archive command that it was a function that was in my RC file, so I know right where it is. Here I know that it's a function that has been run in the current session. And if I was to start a new session, uh, like so, and I type in epoch, it's not going to work. And if I was to uh, run this, it's going to say command, command not found because it was in this session. Uh, so that is the command command, and you might wonder where does the command command live? <laughs> and the, you can run it on itself, and you can see that it's built into the shell. And as I mentioned in a previous, uh, previously in this video, I'm running Z shell, which is my default shell. But if I was to start up Bash, the command command is built into Bash as well, and so I can use it just as I did before within bash. Now, let's look at another command that does something similar. And that would be the type command. So again, example, type dash A instead of capital V, and we can type free. And you can see again, it does basically the same thing. Let me go ahead and go man. Uh, oh, that's not going to work. That's actually next tutorial. Uh, <laughs> and I can do type dash A archive. And again, it's going to tell me the same thing that command command does. And don't get confused. Again, we're working in a Linux shell. If you're in Windows, type is a completely different command. Now, I haven't worked with Windows in years, but back in the day, and I'm pretty sure it still is, type is basically like the cat command. If you wanted to output a file, uh, you would type type and the name of the file. And of course, just like the command command, I can say command type A and type in type, and it tells you it's a built-in command. And you can type in type A, or type, dash a command and you can also run command on type so that is the command and type and we're going to look at this a little bit more in the next because they are built into the shell 
So is that going to always work for us if we're working with different shells? That's what we'll talk about in the next video or in a coming video. I've got a few more things on this topic. So I do hope you're enjoying these videos. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, comment, um, and uh, visit my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. There is a link in the description of the video there. There you can search through all my videos from both my channels. You can also support me there in the sports section. There's a link to my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash metalx1000, and also a, a, a PayPal link. If you like to support me that way, if you can't support me that way, think about sharing, liking, comment, subscribing. All that stuff helps out a great deal. I do thank you for watching. Hope you found this useful, and I hope that you have a great day. Hello and welcome. This is part of a series. I sure hope that you check out the full playlist. There should be a link in the description or at the end of this video. And not only this playlist, but I have hundreds of shell scripts tutorials. Just check my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. There's a link in the description. Today we're going to be looking at the help command. A lot of you may be familiar with the man uh, command, which is the manual command. If not, you really should. You're probably looking up stuff online. Don't need to. For those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, most programs in the shell, you can type in man, and I'll give you an example. We'll do nmap, and it will give you a manual on how to use that program. And a good man page will have examples as well, as I talked about in previous videos. So lots of options here in the nmap uh, man page. But what happens when you do something like, I don't know, have a command like um, type? which we talked about in the previous video. We also talked about the command command. Let's go ahead and type in man command. Oh, no manual entry. What if I type in man type? Well, there is, but it's not the command we're looking for. Uh, these are built-in functions into the shell, and although there might be notes on it, if you were to, um, like man bash if you're in a bash shell which is a very long man page because there's lots of commands built in and there might be some information in there on these commands since they're built in commands but it's a long man page and yes you can search through it but there's an easier way uh, the help command the help command so we can type in help and type and I get an error here and that's because help is not built into Z shell, which I'm currently using here. So, but if you're running bash, I can type in help and I can type in the type command. And here we go. I get a little help uh, display here. Basically just, just like a quick little man page. Um, you know, some programs have this built in. You type in the command and help. But in this case, I have the help command and I can also do command and I get the command uh, help page. So remember when you're working with different shells not everything might be there. Built-in functions might be different and if I command help oh sorry command dash v help let's see what happens here. It tells me it's a built it's built into the shell. Uh, if I exit back out here what happens if I do command dash v here. I'm curious I haven't tried this yet. See it's not found because it's built into Bash. It's not built into Z Shell. There might be something similar in Z Shell that I'm familiar, unfamiliar with. Uh, so that's important to know. So, so now we've looked at using the type and command command to um, to see where programs are, and we can find out which ones are built into the shell and which one are external programs. And if it's built in and there's no man page, sometimes there is, sometimes they're not. Um, but the help command will help you, but only if it's built into your shell. So. Uh, again, if you're in bash, help and the name of the command, such as command, and you'll get the help page. Uh, so that's it for this tutorial. Uh, I do hope that you're enjoying it. It was a quick one. Uh, and yeah, I love Z shell, and, but I also love bash. 
And it's a shame there's no, the help command isn't built in, but again, there might be something else I'm unaware of. If there is, let me know in the comments. If you like my videos, you like these shell script tutorials, be sure to keep on watching. Subscribe so you don't miss any. There's a full playlist in the link of the, in the description of this video, hopefully at the end of this video as well, if I don't forget to put it there. Uh, and again, I have hundreds and hundreds of shell script videos in the past. Check out my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. There's a link in the description there. You can search through all my videos from both my channels. And also think about supporting over at patreon.com for slash mailx1000 or with PayPal. You can find that in the support section on my website if you can support me that way. It really does help if you share these videos, like these videos, watch these videos. And uh, I'm not going to lie, I use ad blockers, but uh, if you could turn them off while you're watching my videos, that would help out too. I do thanks for watching and uh, as always, I hope that you have a great day. Hello and welcome. This video is part of a series, it's part of a playlist. Uh, check out the playlist in the links in the description of this video. I hope that you're enjoying the series so far. I hope you continue watching. If you see a video that isn't released yet, it's saying you can't access it. It's because it hasn't been posted yet. Patreon supporters get early access to videos, so hopefully if you're a Patreon supporter, you've got this as a download already early on. Today we're going to be looking at the PWD, uh, PWD command. The PWD command, let's type that in, PWD. It's going to tell me where I am. I'm in my home directory. If I was to move directories, say, into my www folder here, now it's PWD, it'll tell me right where I'm at. And if I move back out, I can PWD again. It'll tell me what I am, what directory I am in. And in previous videos, we talked about the command command and the type command. Let's go ahead and use type this time, dash A. And uh, then we'll type in PWD. And look at this. So a lot of commands will tell you the location of that command, or if it's a built-in command, or if it's a function, or if it's in your RC file. Well, in this particular case, it's telling me that it's built into the shell, but then it's also giving me an external executable. Why is that? Well, sometimes you come across some commands that are built into the shell, but then there's sometimes they are also external commands, and sometimes they work a little different. So, let's have a little bit look at this. So, I am in a bash shell right now, and uh, if the built-in bash, so if I was to type in, as we learned in a previous video, help pwd, you can see here that uh, it will print the name of the current working directory. It has two options, l and p here, and the l prints the value of pwd, which is a variable in your shell, if it is, if its name is currently, is the current working directory. And it tells you right here that it, le uh, it behaves with the dash l by default. So, again, if I PWD, it's going to tell me what directory I am. Let me move into my temp folder here, though. And I'm really going to quick, I'm going to make a link file, uh, dash s. And I'm going to say uh, dot test. And now if I list out, I can move in to this test link. And you can see I'm in the same folder. Now, if I was to type in this command, the PWD command, it's telling me I'm in temp test. But if I was to type in the full path to the external executable and hit enter, you, t you see it's telling me that I'm in temp because the L which is the default on the built-in, will tell you for links. The external command does not do that by default. So again, PWD will tell me where I am, including the link, where the external command will tell me that I'm in temp because the link is temp is is pointing the link is linking to temp. I hope that makes sense. But if I can I can add in that capital L and the external command works the same. The difference between the two in this case is that the internal command defaults to having that dash capital L for symbolic links. So 
uh, if I was typing man PWD here, we're getting a man page here. But this man page is for the external command. And you can see right here, it uses the PWD from the environment, even if it contains symbolic links. That's the cat, well, the L. And it doesn't say anywhere that it uses that by default. And if we say help PWD, we get the help command for the internal command, which says that it does use, it behaves with that. So there is a difference. For the most part, they're the same programs, but that could, that could mess you up if you're writing a code and you're trying to uh, see when you're in a certain directory that's a symbolic link and your program's checking that and it's getting, no, it's not, it's not. Well, that's because it's not using the dash shell. So it is important to know which one you're using and different shells may act different. Again, I'm in the bash shell. So these are things you need to know so that you don't uh, you know, mess up your code. Uh, bash is probably one of the most common shells out there that is used by default, but it's not always, especially if you're working on lightweight devices like, like um, a router or a modem or even a cell phone. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out. There's other commands like this as well. Uh, but again, so reviewing this video and previous videos, if we type dash A, and the PW command, P PWD command, it's telling us that there is a built-in version of that program and an external. And for the most part, they're the same, except for the built-in looks at symbolic links by default. You can find out how to use the built-in one with help PWD. You can find out how to use the external one with man PWD to see the differences, which they both have the same options. Um, it's just one defaults to another. And that's pretty much it. I do thank you for watching. I hope you found this useful. I hope you found this interesting. And if you did, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and comment. I hope you keep watching my videos. I got plenty of them. Visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. Link in the description of the video. You can search through my videos from both my channels there. I do appreciate you watching. Think about supporting over at patreon.com. There's a link in the description of the video. As well as on my website under support, you can support at Patreon or through PayPal. Can't support me financially. Think about liking, sharing, subscribing to my channel. And again, as I said in the previous video, I use ad blockers. I completely understand. I'm not holding it against you. But if you could occasionally turn them off while you watch my videos, I would appreciate it. I do thank you for watching. And as always, I hope that you have a great day. Okay, real quick here. This is kind of a redo of yesterday's video. Well, I wasn't pleased with the cop, uh, quality, so I'm gonna use the built-in screen recorder for Android, but it only records for a couple minutes, so I've gotta do this quick. So right now, I am at a shell on my Android device using ConnectBot, which is using the default shell uh, of my system, which may vary from Android system to Android system, depending on what they have this default shell set up as. And if I was to run the command dash capital V command and check the command command, it's going to tell me that it's built in the shell. But if I was to run the type A, type dash A type command, it's going to give me an error saying that Wentz doesn't know the dash A option. And if I was to run the type command without the dash A option there, you'll see that it says that type is an alias for the built-in command whence dash v. So the default shell on my particular phone, and may vary from phone to phone, but I'm just showing you that the different shells have different built-in commands. It doesn't have a type command. Rather, it's alias to a whence command, which is slightly different. And if I was to echo out dollar uh, sign zero, it's going to show me what my shell is, or at least what it's linked to. And in this case, system bin sh. Uh, so that's the binary that we're using on my default phone here. Now, if I was to switch over to uh, Termux, which is a great shell application for Android phones, if you do not already use it, I recommend checking it out. And if we run the same commands as before, the command-v command and the command uh, da or the type dash a command, you can see that the command command is a built in shell. And this one actually has the type command built in. And again, if we were to echo dollar sign zero, 
it's going to tell us that our default shell is inside the Termux file system, and it's actually running a copy of Bash, and that's why type is built in. Anyway, that was just a quick review, a quick go over of yesterday's video uh, in hopefully a better quality here. I do thank you for watching, and as always, please visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with the K. There's a link in the description. As always, I hope that you have a great day. Hello and welcome. This video is part of a series. Be sure to check out the uh, description of this video for a full playlist. We've been looking at commands and how to find them, the location of the executables, and whether they're built in, functions, aliases, and all that sort of stuff. And as I've mentioned in previous videos, different shells may act different, especially when it comes to built in commands. So here I am. I'm on my Android uh, phone. Here's a Nexus 5X. Uh, and currently, I'm right now we're in a program called ConnectBot, and ConnectBot uh, allows you to connect locally to yourself. So right now, I'm at the shell using whatever the default shell on this particular phone is, and it may vary from phone to phone. Some use BusyBox, some use ToyBox, some use a standalone shell. Let's go ahead and uh, in here in ConnectBox, issue the command command on itself and see what it says. So we'll just type command command. And it says that it is a built-in shell, or built-in command, which is what we expect. But if I was to run the type uh, dash a type, it's, it's, it's New Year's Day and people are still setting off fireworks, so if you hear that outside, I apologize. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and hit enter. And there you can see we get an error here. It's saying uh, the whence or the when ce dash doesn't, doesn't know the dash a option. Uh, and you're like, well, I didn't run the type. Well, you'll see why that is in a moment. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, just try removing that dash A option from our command and running type, just type. And there you'll see that it says, let's try to focus this a little better for that line. And it says type is an alias for the built-in function whence dash V. So, technically, the shell that we're using here doesn't have a type command. It has the whence command. And the, when, the type command is linked to that built-in alias. It's an alias for the built-in command whence-v. Uh, so that's how that shell works. And we can even look at what shell I'm running here. Let's, again, clear the screen real quick. And I will... Now, echo dollar sign zero, which shows me where what shell I'm running. And uh, so it tells me that I'm running system slash bin slash sh. Again, the default shell on this particular phone. And actually, most phones will link to that, but you may have a different shell running. Let's go ahead and open up a different program. I'm going to open up a program uh, called Termux. And if you don't use Termux, you should. It is a great shell. Uh, interface on your phone. So here we go. We're at that and this program by default doesn't keep my screen on. Uh, can I make my font bigger? I'm sure I can. I'm not going to mess with it right now. Um, so that's the welcome screen for Tmux. Let's go ahead and issue our commands again. So this time we'll try the command V option. So command V, capital V command. And here, right, as we expect, it says that it's a built-in shell command. And if we were to run our type dash A, we'll hit enter there, and it says that it's type in. So this type is working as we expected. Uh, but you know what? We don't even need to put that dash A in there. I don't know if I said that in previous videos. Even though uh, that's the what we're told to do uh, in the uh, help file, I think it is. Uh, you can just type type type, and usually it will tell you what you want to know as well. So in this case. Uh, type is a built-in shell. Sorry that it gets blurry. Uh, uh, I'm at kind of an angle here. It's hard for me to get straight on view and as it gets closer to the camera it gets out of focus. So it's the best I can do for right now. Um, 
I usually hate filming screens, but sometimes you got to. So let's clear this screen. And again, so this is in the Termux shell, which is not using the default system shell. It's using its own shell here. And in this particular case, if I echo zero, you can see here, well, hopefully you can see, that instead of doing system bin sh, it's using data, data, com, dat, uh, com, termux, files, then the USR bin bash. So it's basically inside this program, there's this own little file operating system, uh, file system for this program, and it's actually running a bash shell uh, compiled for the phone. So again, all depends on what you're having, but know the differences and know how to look it up. So the command command seems to work so far in every shell I've tried. Type sometimes does, sometimes doesn't, sometimes it's linked to other uh, commands. Um, but with one of those, you should be able to figure out what you got going on. And this is just one more view of that. So I just wanted to share that again. Sorry about uh, any blurriness in this video. Uh, it's the best I could do. Uh, with what I've got right now. I do thank you for watching. Please visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris Lee K. If you don't know what I'm talking about in this video, be sure to check out the previous videos in this series. There should be a link in the description of the video or coming up here at the end of the video. Thanks for watching, and I hope that you have a great day. Today we're working with Bash and looking at its histories option. Now, as you probably know, when you're writing stuff in the shells, issuing commands, they're being saved to a file, which you can then scroll through. Uh, so I can hit the up arrow here a couple times and go through different uh, commands that I previously typed. I can hit Control R and search for one, like so. Uh, and I can also type in history, and it gives me a full list of the history uh, with numbers, because you can jump to uh, particular commands and history based on what number they are. Uh, but we're going to be looking at disabling uh, the history temporarily in your session. So let's say you're about to run some commands. Maybe it's a command that's going to have a password in it. And you don't want it saved to your history. Uh, well, we can disable that. So just to show you, I'm going to say echo one and echo two. So now I can scroll up and you can see those are my last two commands using the up and down arrow keys. And now I can also say set plus O, that's a lowercase O, history. Now, if I say echo three and echo four, and I hit up arrow, you'll notice that those last two commands are not stored in there. And I can echo, this is a test. And when I hit up arrow, you'll notice that's not there. The last command in the history is disabling the history. And then two, and that's just for this session. If I was to exit out of this and start a new session, let's actually, let's open up a new session here. We'll say bash, and I'll say echo five, echo six. I can hit up arrow, and those are there. Um, so, going back up here, uh, if I wanted to re-enable history, I just say set mi minus or dash lowercase o history, and now if I echo 7, echo 8, you can see that those are now in my history. Now again, I'm working in the bash shell here. My default shell on my machine is usually z shell. And I have tried this command in Z Shell, and Z Shell does not have this option, at least not like this. I've tried Googling it, and I have found some options that don't quite work like this. Um, if you're aware of one for Z Shell, I didn't look that hard. I'm sure I could find it. Um, but if you're aware of a shell script uh, or a command for the Z Shell uh, that is similar to this, let me know in the comments below. Uh, I do thank you for watching. Again, I hope you find this useful. Again, if you're there's sometimes maybe you're pulling a wget command and you need to put a username and password in there or using curl or something. You can run this command first and then after you issue it, you can re-enable your history and you know that it isn't stored in that history there. That's easier than going in and deleting it from your history file, which is in your home directory. Uh, so I do thank you for watching. Please visit my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. There's a link in the description there. You can support me in the support section using PayPal or through my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash metalx1000. I appreciate you watching. I appreciate your views, your likes, your shares, your comments. And as always, I hope that you have a great day.
Hello and welcome. This video is part of a series. Be sure to check out the full playlist. There should be a link in the description of this video and also be a link at the end of the video. I do thank you for joining me today. I hope that you've watched the previous videos as well as all the hundreds of videos I have on my uh, channel already. You can check out my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There's a link in the description. Today we're going to be looking at the export option when it comes to variables. Now, uh, right here, we're in the shell. We're working in Bash and I can say... Um, x equals 10, we'll say. And I can say echo dollar sign x. And of course, it's going to give me 10. But occasionally, you might see when people are giving instructions on stuff, they might see something like this. Export x10. And if I echo it out, it works the same. I think the first place I saw this, at least that I remember seeing it, was years ago where I was doing um, uh, SSH stuff where I was... Uh, exporting and creating different displays and uh, I saw that I'm like what why is that why are they telling me to export the variable what does that mean well I'm going to tell you what that means today so as you saw I created a variable let's create another variable. I'm going to say y equals 11 and of course I can say export dollar sign y and we get 11 but if we spawn a sub process let's say I start bash another session of bash so up here we're in bash we're in one session, but we just spawned a new session down here. And if I echo dollar sign Y, it's going to say nothing because dollar sign because Y hasn't been um, created yet. Uh, it doesn't exist yet in this session. But if I exit out and then echo Y, you can see that it still equals 11 in the mother <laughs> uh, session, if you want to say that. Uh, so let me go ahead and clear the screen here. So what we can do, if I want to, I can say export in this case we'll do z equals 12 and now that we did that I can say echo dollar sign z and it says 12 and if I start a new session of bash I can say echo dollar sign z and you can see that it has passed this variable the the processes we have spawned uh, from our main process the variables are still existing in that uh, sub process so that's where you might want to use export where you might be spawning different uh, shells and terminals while you're working and you want your variables to follow into that uh, but you don't want to make permanent system variables so uh, I hope that was clear and I hope you understand it and I hope you find it useful and maybe uh, understand more because again for a while I've seen I'd seen that in tutorials and stuff and I I didn't even bother looking up what it meant at first I was like okay if I'm supposed to export the variable I'll export the variable I do thank you for watching please visit filmsbychris.com that's Chris with the K there is a link in the description of the video to my website filmsbychris and there you can search through all my videos from both my channels I have thousands enjoy them and if you like them, think about subscribing, liking, sharing, commenting, and supporting maybe financially with PayPal or through patreon.com forward slash metalx1000. You can find those links at my website or in the description of the video. And even a dollar a month, uh, you know, uh, I appreciate it. If we can get, uh, you know, a bunch of you to do a dollar a month, that would be awesome. I do thank you for watching. Please visit, again, filmsbychris.com, and I hope that you have a great day. Hello and welcome. This is a video by me, Chris, from filmsbychris.com. That's Chris K. There's a link in the description of the video. And this is part of a series. There's a link in the description of the video to the full playlist. If you're going through the playlist and you hit a video that has not been made uh, public yet, that's because it hasn't been published publicly yet. Patreon supporters get early access and uh, downloads to all my videos. Uh, so think about supporting over at patreon.com forward slash metalx1000. I do appreciate all support. And... Um, yeah, so check that out, and if you're not supporting that way, don't worry, the video will become public. Be sure to subscribe and you won't miss it. Today we're going to be looking at creating variables in the shell and then unsetting them. So this is going to be a fairly simple video. Let's create a variable called my var. So I'm in a bash shell right now. I'm going to say my var equals this is my string, and now I can echo dollar sign. Uh, my var, if I could type, 
There we go, and it echoes out the string. I can add to that, I can say echo my var. This is my string that I created, and it echoes out that. But still, my var still equals this is my string. Uh, let's say for some reason you're creating a script and you want to unset a variable at some point. Uh, so you're using it, but then you want to unset it so that it's not being used anymore, and maybe you're doing a check later on to see if that variable still exists, whatever your reason for it. We're gonna say unset. It's that simple, unset, and the name of your variable, my var in this case, and it's now unset. If I try to echo out my var, you can see that it is empty, it is blank, there's nothing there. I can go up into this, it says echo my var that I, ha I, I created, and all it's gonna say is that I created, because that variable no longer exists. And yes, this is a very short video, but it could be very useful. I hope that you found it useful. And if so, again, think about supporting patreon.com forward slash mailx1000 or through PayPal. Be sure to check out my website. Check out all the links in the description of the video. There's plenty of them. Useful stuff. Filmsbychris.com, Chris the K. As always, I hope that you have a great day. Don't forget to share, like, subscribe, comment, all that stuff. It helps me out a bunch. Have a great day. Okay, today we're going to be looking, I'm working in uh, the Bash shell here on my Linux machine, and we're going to be looking at splitting strings uh, based on spaces uh, into separate variables. So here's an example. Let's say I create a variable called my var, and I said the variable, I set it to this is a test. And I can, of course, echo out my var, and it says this is a test. Using the set command, I can say set space dash dash and the name of my variable, dollar sign, my var. Now, if I echo dollar sign one, two, three, and four, you can see that it split each of those variables, that string into each of those variables. So how is this useful? Well, let's look at some examples. Let's look at other ways to do something real quick. So if I if config, I can see my network information. Let's say I want my IP address here. I could do something like, <clears throat> excuse me, I have config, I can grep for init, and then I can pipe that into head dash and one, uh, just to make sure I'm just grabbing the first uh, instance of that. I could also say which uh, network card I want, but right now I'm just gonna head and one. I'm gonna say cut dash D and space space dash 10. So there's two spaces here. So we're saying the delimiter is a space and then I want uh, column 10 based on that. And I get my IP address, my local IP address, uh, which is great. Uh, and actually, actually it'd probably be better because it's a little confusing having that space space there. Another option would be to use awk. I can say awk print dollar sign two saying column two here. So there we go, it gets me the same result. It's just a little bit clearer than so someone might not see those two spaces there if they were looking at this command. Okay, so that's great. Uh, and I can pipe that into a variable. So if I wanted to set my IP uh, to a variable called IP, I can say IP equals inside quotations, dollar sign inside parentheses. Now anytime I echo dollar sign IP, I have my IP address. And I can do the same if I wanted the net mask. I can say, I'll just do NM for net mask and that's column four. And now I can echo dollar sign nm, and I have my net mask. And then I can do the same thing if I want my uh, broadcast IP. So I can say six, and here I'll just say bc. Whoa. Well, I'm gonna call it bc. That, that doesn't matter. There's a command called bc. On it and that's that doesn't matter. Okay, echo dollar sign bc, and you can see I now have that. So if again if we if config, whoops config, you can see that we have cut this, this IP, this IP, and our broadcast IP here. That works, but can we simplify that using what we've learned with the set command? And we can, very simply. 
So what we can do is, just like before, we can say set dash dash, and then before we gave it a string. So that string can be an output of a command. So basically, let's look at this command. We're going to do our if config command here, like this. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're just going to say head one, which just gives us that line. And with a set command, we can now split things up based on numbers. Um, so what I can do is just this. I'll put that inside parentheses and I'll say set dash dash dollar sign parentheses. So we're going to run that command, which gives us this output and sets going to set variables for each of those for us. Now, if I want my IP address, I can just say echo dollar sign two. If I want my net mask, I can say dollar sign four. And if I want my broadcast, I can say six. So with this one command, I quickly created three variables. They're not well labeled variables. Uh, but it is very simple to do. Now, one thing you don't want to do, and I, I like to usually put things like this in quotation marks so it holds it together. And most times that's good, but if we do that now, uh, I believe it messes things up. Yeah. As you can see, I can only do echo one, and it's all that entire string because it kind of put it all together. Anyway, again, so just the set without these quotations. So set dash dash and our command there. And now I can echo dollar sign two, uh, four, and six for this example. So again, this one command was a bit quicker than running our three other commands, which were this command, this command, and this command. We replaced those three, running those three, with one command using the set command. So I hope you do find that useful. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I hope you enjoy all my tutorials. Sure, check them out at filmsbychris.com. That's Chris Decay. There's a link in the description of the video uh, to my website. And there you can search through all my videos from both my channels. I have thousands of, of videos, thousands of tutorials, many of them on the Linux shell. Be sure to check them out, and if you enjoy them, if you enjoy my videos in general, think about supporting patreon.com forward slash melx1000, link in the description of the video. You can also support me through PayPal. There's a link on my website to that. I thank you for watching. And as always, I hope you share, like, share, like, share, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. Helps out a lot, and I hope you have a great day. Okay, so I just did a video, the previous video, on um, you know uh, splitting up output of a command and uh, giving it value. So what we did was we did this command. We did uh, if config, and we wanted to get the IP address. So I did this. I did set dash dash, and then the command with the output there. And then I can do echo dollar sign two to get the IP address. Four would have been the net mask. And uh, five would have been, or sorry, six would have been the uh, broadcast IP, um, which is great. Very simple. A lot better than doing a bunch of cutting and multiple times to get those into different values. Um, one issue with this is that you know you're replacing uh, these variables here, which in a script or a function might already be used. Uh, but also, right after making it, I was like, you know what? I'm basically creating an array here, which. Um, doing it as a regular array, uh, you'll be able to label it a little bit better. So let, let me show you what I mean by that. First of all, let's change this command a little bit. Um, so instead of this, I was grepping for this really, I'm, it doesn't really make a difference, but to make sure we get the right um, device, so you might have a wireless card or an Ethernet card or both or more than one of each, uh, I really should specify which device I want. And then here instead of, uh, I, yeah, I can grep that. And then I don't have to worry about this head command because I don't need to grab the first one. I'm getting the one from this. So now I should still be able to echo dollar sign two and get the IP address. So that shortened it up a little bit. I didn't need that head command if I say which device I want. Okay, but let's do this same thing, but put it into a regular array. So I'll just call the array IP. And I'll say equals, and then I just put this in parentheses like this. And now I can say echo 
and I will say dollar sign IP, oops, IP, and then I can say IP2 or IP4. Obviously, if I did one, it would, you know, give us the other uh, outputs from that, the other columns. Uh, so, I mean, this is a little bit longer than typing this, but you kind of know what it is. It's labeled properly. You're not necessarily overriding uh, variables that might already exist. So I just wanted to bring that up. I don't know why I didn't think of that earlier. Really, uh, you know, you get in, in habits of doing stuff, which, you know, allows you to get things done. But lots of times in the past, I would have done this by doing, if I want the IP address, I would have done, you know, basically uh, a few cut commands and all that stuff and put that. And then I'd run the whole series of commands again if I needed the net mask or the broadcast. I would run multiple things. So cutting down the number of processes and shorting the command by using an array, either using the set command or array is definitely a better way to go. Uh, but I think this is a little bit clearer, although the output is a few characters longer, uh, but we're actually putting it into array call IP or whatever you want to call the array. So that's it. D don't do this though, because uh, that's going to then put the whole command or the whole output of the command like so. You won't be able to cut it up. So don't put these parentheses. That was the first, what I did at first when I first tried this, uh, which again would tell it to ignore the spaces and say in these parentheses is one value. So I hope that made sense. And yeah, just after doing the last video, I was like, oh, you know what? There's, there's probably a better way to do that. That is really obvious. I should have realized a long time ago. But again, you kind of have like your mindset on how to do something because you've done it so long and you keep doing it that way. Uh, so anyway, Thank you for watching. I hope that you do enjoy my videos. If you do, think about subscribing, liking, sharing, commenting. All that stuff is awesome. But you can also support me over at Patreon.com, patreon.com forward slash MetalX1000. There's a link to that in the description, as well as a link to my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There's, again, a link in the description. There you can search through all my videos from both my channels. Um, and you can also find a support section there where, other than just Patreon, there's also a PayPal link if you want to support me that way. I do thank you for watching, and as always, I hope that you have a great day. Okay, today we're going to be looking at IP tables. So uh, let me give you a rundown on what prompted this tutorial. A couple of weeks ago I was out at the park with my family and I realized I had to do something on my web server, my Films by Chris server. So I went to SSH in and nothing happened. I you know, typed in the SSH command and never asked for a password and it just kind of sat there, it just hung. Uh, I was like, oh, that's not good, is my server down? So I went to filmsbychris.com in the web browser and it was working fine. Uh, so I'm like, okay, maybe SSH server crashed. So I went to the virtual machine settings and restarted the whole machine and still same thing. And then I realized, oh, well, I had connected to some open Wi-Fi uh, from a nearby school and apparently they must be blocking port 22, um, which is just silly because it, that's easy enough to get around. I was actually able to get around it because uh, I actually have some port forwarding going on on my Pogo plug at home. Uh, since I'm running multiple servers here, it's uh, so I had it running on a different port. I could SSH into that and then uh, pivot to my Films with Chris server from there. But I'm going to show you how to do different port forwarding. Now, port forwarding, you probably might be, com might be familiar with it, especially if you do SSHing to your machine at home. You know, in your router settings where you go in and you say, okay, when something comes in at this port to the router, we're going to redirect to this machine. That's something that we're going to do today. We're going to be using IP tables, which is a program that uh, allows you to basically do uh, set up rules for your network. Uh, but instead of redirecting to another machine, we're going to redirect to the same machine, but uh, to a different port. So I am going to copy and paste this command because I actually already tried recording this tutorial twice and I kept typing things wrong. I will give uh, links to notes in the description and if they're not there, remind me because sometimes I forget to put those there. But you're going to have to be sudo root. So we're going to say sudo uh, IP tables and we're going to do dash t, whoops, dash t net, uh, dash i, we're doing some pre-routing, 
dash p we're going to be using a tcp protocol uh dash dash d port 2222 or no 2222 uh and that could be any number you want that's within the range of IP addresses. I would not use 2222. I'm just using that in the example here. I would pick a higher number that is not commonly used that you can remember. So um, the reason I would not pick 2222 is because I've seen servers, for example, I used to host uh, Films by Chris uh, using HostGator, and their default SSH port was 2222. Um, so I would say that it seems like it might be commonly used, so there's a good possibility that it might be blocked as well. So just pick a higher number that you can remember that's uh, in the range of ports, which is 65,000 something, I think is the highest number. Anyway, uh, next we're going to say dash J, and we're going to redirect to ports 22. So that's our first command. We ran that successful, everything's typed properly because I copied and pasted it rather than typing that all out. Um, next command is another IP tables dash uh, T nat dash output dash P still uh, TCP protocol and then dash O L O so L O is your uh, basically local network interface real quick actually I'm going to control C out of that command I'm going to do nmap sorry nmap local host real quick I just, I should have meant to show you this before, so port 2222 is not open, but if I if config, you'll see that I have my Ethernet card, and then you usually have this low interface. Low interface is a loopback interface. It's basically like a virtual interface. Even if you had no network cards, you'll have a low interface. So basically it's just saying, uh, we're coming in on port 22, and we're going to loop back to the same machine. Um, so... Again, let me copy and paste. So we're saying use the loopback interface to redirect port 22 to our port 2222 to port 22. Now I hit enter. So we've run those two commands. So again, this is the first command here. And then this is the second command here. Again, I'll try to put those in the notes. And now if I nmap localhost, you'll see that we have port 2222 open. And you notice that it does have a name here, which means or a service here, that this port might be used by other servers. I've, I don't know what ethernet IP-1 is, but the fact that it has a name means that that port does have a commonly used purpose. So if you're seeing that, it may not be the best port to use. Um, but now I can do SSH local Ah, local <laughs> host and that would be normal I hit that it goes to port 22 like it normally would but I can also say dash P 2222 and again it brings us to our, our local host so basically just forward port 22 let's run that again uh, let's run this command here but change this to port 2221 and then the second command here Two 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 one, and now if I really quick nmap localhost, you notice it doesn't show up again. Uh, when you just run nmap like this, it's doing a quick scan of commonly used ports, so it's not scanning every port. But if I tell it specifically to scan port two 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 one, you'll see that it does tell me that it's open and that its service is normally a Rockwell dash CSP one. Um, so just to be aware of that, you may not see that port being used. Uh, so that just shows that port 2222 is probably commonly used since it's in the commonly scanned ports. Anyway, I can uh, SSH local host port 2221 and get connect port 2222 or just port 22. So all of them are actually going to port 22. So now if port 22 is blocked, it doesn't matter because I am reconnecting to it through a different port that's just forwarding to the other port. <sighs> Clear as mud. <laughs> Again, I will put those commands in the link in the description, but for now I will also just, for your convenience, put them up on the screen here, right there. I will leave them up there while I talk here for a moment. I just want to say thank you for watching. I hope you found this video useful. I hope that you enjoy my videos. If you do, think about visiting filmsbychris.com. 
That's Chris Decay. There's a link in the description. Uh, check that out. There you can uh, search through all my videos. There's also a link there to um, search through my scripts. And this is actually in my notes. So when you go there, it will bring you to a little website uh, that will load up uh, a list of my scripts. It's actually very poorly written. It actually loads up every single script from my Pastebin account um, into the uh, HTML of the page, and then it searches through that. So it's a little slow as I add more. I really should um, have it search the database and then just output what you're searching. But anyway, uh, so filmsbychris.com, you can search through my videos. You can search through all my scripts. If I do forget to put this uh, code, a uh, link to this in the link in the description of this video, um, remind me, but it is in my um, notes. So filmsbychris.com, click on scripts, and that should bring you to a little search uh, where you can search through all my notes and just type in IP tables. I don't have very many uh, notes on IP tables, so you should be able to find it there. Um, think about supporting patreon.com forward slash metalx1000. Uh, there's a link to that in the description of this video. Also on my website under the support section. You can also support me through PayPal. I do want to thank you for watching. Uh, and as always, I hope that you have a great day. Okay, today we're going to be looking at aliases and how to, um, you know, bypass them when need be. So here's an example. If I type ls, it's going to list out the files in the directory. There's three uh, files in the current directory. Now let's say I like this command and I use it often. ls-lha, that's um, the list view, human readable, and all, I believe. I hit that, it's going to give me a view like this, which gives me a lot more information on the files. Let's say I, I want to use that as my default ls command. I can say alias ls equals, and inside single quotes or double quotes, I can say ls and give it those uh, functions. Now if I type ls here, uh, you can see it runs that command. So, uh, well I have different settings in my bash rc file, so I lost my color settings in there, but that's, that's not uh, what we're talking about today anyway. So now anytime I type ls, it's going to run that full command. But let's say I have that set, but now I do want it to just display the file names. Yeah, do I I can unset the um, the variable by use or the alias by saying unalias ls. And now if I ls, you can see it's back to the default ls command. Uh, but let's go ahead and re-enable it. First off, unaliasing. Now it's like, now if I want that back, I have to re-alias again. Un un unaliasing also un only unaliases it for um, the current session. So if I start up a new session of Bash and that alias is in my Bash RC file, it's going to be re-enabled in the next session. All I want is to be able to quickly, you know, I always want it to be like this, but occasionally I want it to be the old way. Well, there's a few different ways to do that. First way, so ls does this, but if I want to use the default ls command, I can give it the full path to the ls command. Uh, well, I can, for, I can use the command command, which we've talked about in the past. I can say command, uh, command, I can say command ls, and it's going to run the actual ls command, not our alias. Uh, and then uh, the ls command can also be, that's a little bit long, what is what I'm trying to say, I'm sorry. I'm losing my train of thought. Typing the command is a little bit long, so there's other ways. You can also put the ls command in double quotes or single quotes. See, again, if I do it without those, it prints it the long list. Another option, that's probably the easiest, is to backslash ls. Another way would be to type out the full path to the command. So, like, it would be uh, usr bin ls, which I don't actually think, yeah. Uh, where is ls? Uh, so let's do bin ls. So I could do that. I could type out, I, if I knew where the the command was, and it's either going to be usr bin ls or bin ls, uh, it's going to be in one of those folders. Could could be somewhere else as well. Um, so again, 
I have this alias set. I just want to temporary just this one time, bypass it, I can backslash it. I can put it in quotations, single or double. I can type command ls, or I can type out the full path to the command so it avoids the alias. And again, you can unalias it, which turns it off for this entire session. Uh, but if it's in your bash RC file or, or Z shell RC file or whatever, it's going to be re-enabled the next time you start a new shell. So keep those in mind. Thought you might find that useful because aliases are great, but sometimes you want to go back to the default command. And I, I personally think just the backslash would be the easiest. So thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Please visit my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. There's a link in the description of the video. Uh, please check out my website. Search through all my videos. Find what you're looking for. I have thousands of videos. You can also support me, patreon.com forward slash metalx1000 or through PayPal. Support section on my website there. So I thank you for watching. Please visit filmsbychris.com and I hope that you have a great day. Hello, I hope you're enjoying this sh series on Linux shell commands, and um, be sure to check out the full playlist, there should be a link in the description of the video. Um, and today we're going to be looking at logging uh, messages to log files on the system. Now, let's say you're, you're writing a script and it's going to try to do some things, and obviously if there is an error it fails, you're going to have some output to the screen to the user, but you may want to log it to a log file for the system, and there are different log files for different things, um, just to have a record of that so that, you know, the sysadmin can go back and, and look over it and see where these errors are happening. So, uh, let's go ahead and just quickly look at the end of one of these uh, log files. So I'm going to use the tail command, which uh, will show us the last 10 lines by default of a file. And we're going to say var log messages. And that's one of the log files. And you do have to have permission to do this, so I'm going to sudo. And you can see the last 10 lines of that log file. It tells you, uh, you know, it was on the local host, uh, you know, the the user that uh, created, generated this message, this was a network manager, um, and then like down here was an example I did, which, uh, so my name's MetalX1000, and then the error message. So let's go ahead and see how you log to that file. Obviously, you, know, you, you, you shouldn't just write directly to it by, uh, you know, redirecting your output into it. There's actually a command called logger. And you can do something like logger, this is an error. Obviously, you'd want to give a little more information than that. We do that, and now if we run that same tail command, you can see that there was a, on um, the date and time, on the local host, this user, this is an error, was dumped into that file. So let's go ahead and uh, work that into a command. So let's say we wanted to copy, and I'll make up a file here that doesn't exist. I'll say my file.log, and we want to copy that to our temp folder because we're backing up to our temp folder, whatever. You know, obviously you don't want to back things up to your temp folder because it's temporary. Anyway, we'll just call it backup.log. Um, and we'll give it a number, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So we do that and it's going to fail, obviously, because that file doesn't exist. What we can do is, one way of doing this is checking is doing the double pipe as I've shown in previous uh, tutorials. That means if the last command fails, do this. And we can say echo fail and now uh, not only do we get the copy command error but we also get our little fail, fail error which obviously you want to give a little more information than that um, but we can also use our our log command so I can say logger um, with two G's and I'll hit error and it's been logged to the system file so now if I was to go up and tail that out again you can see that that message get there. And obviously, again, you'd want to give more information than just a fail. Um, but if you wanted to do both, and again, there's different ways to do this. You can do a full if-then statement if you're writing this in a script. As a one-liner, I can put this in parentheses and add two commands in here. So I can say echo fail, which you're getting the output from the copy command in this case anyway. But fail, I'll say logger, fail to copy file 
and we'll say this file and then I'll hit enter. So in a script it would try copying this file to here and it's saying well if it fails give our fail output which shows right here on the screen but also log it and so now we can say uh, tail that and you can see right down here that it has been logged. It gives it the date and time, what user was running it, uh, obviously on local host, and the error message. And you want to be as descriptive as possible without getting too long. And uh, that's just uh, one log file. If I was to uh, list out here, I can list out all the var log files. You can see there's a bunch of them, blah, 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 for different things. And there's different ways to write to them. Uh, so go ahead and look through the man file for logger. So you just man logger should bring it up. And it will give you different um, options while running this command. So, you know, look through that, learn a little bit, but very simple to just do that basic command that logs to the, uh, the messages log. And um, that's pretty much it. It's not a bad idea if your script is doing anything of importance and you want to be able to troubleshoot it later to write to the system log files so you have an ongoing record of that. And the system takes care of those. Uh, depending on your system setup, every so often it's going to. Um, tar those files to compress them down, uh, tar and gzip them I believe uh, is the compression used and uh, it will keep them for so long so you can go back quite a ways on a Linux system unlike uh, the default on like a Windows system once you if it logs anything once you restart lots of times that stuff is gone um, luckily a Linux system by default backs up and it's just little text file text files are compressed over time so you can definitely troubleshoot quite a while back so I do, as always, thank you for watching. Please visit my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There's a link in the description of the video. Uh, there you can look through all my videos. You can also go to my scripts, my notes, and search through all my scripts and notes. Um, you can also support me in the support section, either through PayPal or patreon.com forward slash millx1000. I'm actually looking into some other options. I heard about something new the other day, uh, but I don't want to put it up there. I don't want to start using it until I know more about it. Um, but different ways to support me and uh, if you can't support me financially think about liking sharing subscribing and commenting those thumbs ups help a lot shares definitely the more views I get the better I do thank you for watching and as always I hope that you have a great day Hello and welcome. I hope that you're enjoying the series so far on shell commands for your Linux shell. And today we're going to be looking at a program called iNotifyWait, uh, which allows you to monitor directories and files for modifications and things such as that and just them being accessed. So let's go ahead and the command uh, you would have to install. So you can sudo apt install iNotify, let's see. I notify tools on Debian based system. I don't know if it might be called something different. I already have it installed, so I don't need to do that right now. So I'm going to say I notify wait, and I'm going to say dash m, and I'm going to look at a directory that does not exist at this moment. So I'm going to hit that. It's going to tell me it doesn't exist. So let's go ahead and, and create that real quick. So I'm just going to say make dir. So that now exists. I can now run this command, and it's sitting there and it's watching and it's waiting. And I'm going to open up another shell here and I'm going to echo test into a file inside that directory. So I'll say echo test into uh, temp examples my file or move file my file and as you can see up here it tells you that the, in this directory there was a file created it was my file it was opened it was modified and it was written to and closed. So uh, that's monitoring a directory for any changes made to it. Let's go ahead, I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to uh, uh, kill this command, the control C, and now I'm going to point it at that file. I'm going to say my file and hit enter. So now it's monitoring that file in particular. So I can come back down here and I can run that, you know, I can keep adding to that, or actually I'm not adding to it, I'm replacing it each time. Uh, and uh, let's see, I'm just curious if I do this. Yeah, it just it just doesn't say whether it's added to. It just tells you that it was open, modified, written to, and closed. So, uh, but 
that's just monitoring that one file. If I add to a different file, you see nothing happens up there because it's only monitoring that one file. But if I come back up here and run the original command, which is looking at the directory, now whether I'm adding to file two or the first file, it will log it up there. Or not log it, but let you know. It will monitor it and tell you. So let's go ahead and um, change that a little bit. Right here, it's telling you whether it's open, closed. So let's go ahead and, and monitor this file again. Let's see my file. What happens if I go vim and I say to my file? Up there, it tells you, you know, what was happened to it. And I can say write file. And it tells you, you know, attributes change. So it's telling you a lot of stuff here. But let's say we only want to be monitor, mon um, notified of the modifications, not when it was open, not when it was closed, just when it was modified. So let's go ahead and kill this command. And we're going to run that same command again. Uh, but instead of just M, we're going to do dash Q and dash E. Now, uh, and then type modified here modify. So now you can see it's only telling me when it's been modified. So I saved it there. I can write to it this way and it's only telling me when it's been modified. Not that it's been open or closed or written to, just that it's been modified in some way. Um, and there's a lot of options. Again, look through the man pages for more information on that. But let's go ahead and send a system message out. And there's different ways you can use. You can use send notify. I guess there's another, uh, not not uh, notify send. Uh, there's notify-osd I've seen people use uh, to get GUI pop-ups. But another command that we can look at is the wall command. A wall command, I can say wall test, and it sends that command to every shell running. It broadcasts it, says who sent it. So if you're on a system with multiple people and everyone's using a shell, you can run that, and it just sends that message, says who sent it and when and from where. Uh, to the entire system. So that's great. You're working in another shell. You may not be looking at this, but you'll get a notification up on the screen when things change. So let's go ahead and modify our little command up here so we can incorporate that into it. So we're going to run the same command we ran looking for when it's been modified. And this is my first thought when I was testing this out. Read, I'll say line, and I'll say do, and I'll say wall dollar sign L and done. Now, if I come down here and let me open up two shells here uh, like that. So you'll see that it goes to both shells. So I'm going to modify that file. Boom. So all my shells got a message saying that was modified. So that that's awesome. I get that. Now, there are certain times when the if you're modifying the file in a certain way where you're going to get uh, multiple outputs. So here I got the one wall command here to it, but sometimes there's certain modifications that it seems to modify it twice and um, you get double messages. I don't necessarily want double messages. Uh, so especially if you're using one of the GUI applications, you'll get multiple boxes up on the screen. So let me go ahead and kill this. If you look in the man file, uh, the man file actually has a slight variation on what I did. Uh, so basically it's the same command uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to be sure to say redirect dev null here, uh, semicolon, and we're going to say uh, instead of doing while here, we're actually going to write it. So we're going to say while this command is running, and we don't need the dash m here according to them. So we're going to say q e modify this file dump into while and then we're going to say wall and um, we're just going to say here file modified I'm going to go ahead and hit enter and in this particular scenario it should work the same way here it's instead of saying the output from the command it's actually just saying our message so that's a slight variation there um, and again, in the example I'm giving, it's not doing two messages, but uh, when I did test it in certain ways, you'd get double messages, especially with the uh, uh, notify send. It was popping up multiple boxes. This variation on the command uh, works a little bit better. Um, so that's again in the man file. Uh, and there you can, you know, if you're concerned, maybe you think, uh, you know, there's some reason you want to modify that. You want to know when it's been updated. 
Um, maybe you're checking a mail file, although there's better ways to check a mail file using proc mail and stuff. Um, but you're waiting for a file to be modified and you want to be notified when it happens. You can use the wall command, but I uh, notify wait and the again the package on at least the Debian based system is uh, I notify wait dash tools. Go ahead, install that, and now you can monitor when files and folders are modified and send yourself messaging. I mean, here I'm doing a broadcast out to everybody using the wall command. Uh, we again can do GUI where you get the little box with something like notify send, but you can also have it send you emails or texts from your computer so that, you know, you're not at your computer, your phone will get a message uh, wherever you're at. I do thank you for watching. Uh, again, this video is part of a series. Be sure to check out the full playlist. Uh, as always, uh, you can go to my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with the K. There's a link in the description there. You can go through all my videos, search through them very conveniently. Uh, you can also um, support me there in the support section. Uh, we got the patreon.com forward slash millx1000. Also have PayPal link there. Any support, even a dollar a month, is much appreciated. And uh, also there, you can also look at my script section, which will bring you to my notes, and you can search through. Right now I have almost 600 uh, pastebin notes, but I made a searchable application there, so you can search through them all. It's not the best written search application because it dumps a lot of data. It could have been written much better, but you can search through there. And uh, as always, I thank you for watching, and I hope that you have a great day. This video is part of a series. Be sure to check out the full playlist in the link in the description of this video. I hope you're enjoying these shell script tutorials. And uh, we're looking at some shell commands today. Today we're going to be looking at the getting the PID, uh, the process ID of a running process, a running program. Uh, you, this is useful to in many ways to kill a process. But if you need to get a process ID, there's a few different ways. The way that I normally do it, which is not the best way, and I think a lot of people do this, is they use the PS command. So if I if I PS, I, it will give me a list of running programs, but that's just for this current session. If I do uh, AUX is usually the way I run it, which gives me for all users and all that stuff. And then, of course, I can grep that if I want to say, let's say my shell is Z shell, so I probably have a few of those running right there. Let's clear the screen and run that again. So this is all the Z shell, or at least all the commands uh, running with the word Z shell in there, which is not necessarily all Z shell uh, processes. For example, I'm getting the grep command that I just ran because it has the word Z shell. So that's not the best, not the cleanest way to do it. Well, you can also use the PS command uh, if you look in the man page. Dash capital Z is case sensitive, and I type ZSH, it's going to give us nice little clean. These are, you know, uh, processes, here's the IDs, the TTY for them, and uh, time, uh, which we're not even going to look at, but uh, CMD is the command. So that's nice, clean, we're not going to have to worry about that. Grep command, blah, blah, blah. And that's fine. And if we want to, there's probably a PS command to get just the process ID, uh, but I would pipe this into uh, just doing what I know, uh, dollar sign one, meaning the first column. And that kind of works. We got the process IDs here, but we also have this PID, which we could remove with awk or grep, blah, 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 blah. But we're piping, again, unnecessarily. We don't need to do that. And again, there might be a PS command to get this process ID. Uh, look through the man page. But I'm going to show you uh, two other ways that actually uh, work a little bit better. Uh, one, and this is the simplest, remember, is PID of. So it will give you the PID of, and I can say Z shell here, and it just gives us all the process IDs for the Z shell processes. Another one is pgrep. Uh, and I said to say pgrep Z shell. And it basically gives you the same output, not necessarily the same where it looks like reversed. Um, one gives you in a column format, one gives you, you know, with spaces, either or. You can loop through those uh, and kill them all if you want. 
although the kill all command <laughs> would also work. Um, but you can go through those, and if you need the PID uh, of a process, uh, whether it's running one or more, those are probably the two cleanest ways I know of, is PID of and PGREP. Uh, so check those out. And I know a lot of, there's a lot of different variations of grep out there, egrep, pgrep, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of those processes, depending on the version of grep you have, uh, well, those processes, a lot of those functions, depending on what version of grep you have, might be built into regular grep already. And in fact, that might be an alias for regular grep. I don't even look into that. I just know pgrep, Z shell. But actually, PID of is the one that I've started using recently because it's just um, easy to remember. If I just need the PID, obviously, um, doing uh, my original command, if I'm, uh, let's see, PSAUX grep Z shell, uh, gives me a little more information if I'm looking for a particular one, I go, oh, and then I can copy and paste. But if I just want to script it out to grab the PID of all the processes or, you know, maybe find the latest one, I can use one of those other commands, and it's a bit cleaner. Uh, one of the most powerful things in a, in a shell is the, the ability to pipe the output of one command into another command, but at the same time, you should limit doing that as much as you can because you're running processes you don't necessarily need if one command can do it. So, I do thank you for watching. Uh, as always, uh, be sure to check out my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with the K. There's a link in the description there. You can search through all my scripts, my notes, under the uh, scripts section. It's either called scripts or notes on my website. I need to check. I think it's called scripts, and it'll bring you to my notes, uh, which is basically uh, anytime I create a script or write notes for myself, I put them in paste bin. And paste bin is great, but there's no really clean way to search through it. So every day I have a cron job on my uh, server that pulls down the latest uh posts that I've done, puts them into a database, and then this interface on my website will search through it in a very sloppy way. I actually have every script load into the HTML of the page, and then I use JavaScript to, to sort through that, and really I should be sorting it with the database, not loading everything to the page because it makes it a little slow. It's not that slow on a desktop computer. On a phone, right now there's almost 600 scripts in there, and again, it searches through all of the words on that, and your device doing that, so on an older phone, it might take three to five seconds for it to filter through everything. So I really need to rewrite that to do everything on the server side, just as a, you know, just that's, but I'm actually holding off on that because I'm actually starting to use GIST more. So I'm posting all my scripts to Pastebin and GIST. So I'll probably look into seeing if there's an API for GIST um, and start using that instead because that definitely is a little bit nicer because it does revisions and stuff like that if you've never used it. Uh, if you've used Git, it's like Git, but for, you know, projects there's one or two files rather than a full-blown project anyway i'm babbling now but looking through that i have lots of great notes there i put it there i built for myself but i'm sharing it with you guys i go there all the time you know i know i know how to do something but i don't remember how to do it i can type in the keywords and it will narrow down my my scripts and i can look and see how to do something without having to google it and then read through articles it's just the my notes are very short or code there Check it out. Also, check out the support section on my page. You can go to patreon.com forward slash melox1000 or my PayPal account. Again, all at filmsidechris.com. Go ahead, check that out. Support is great. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, comment, all that fun stuff. I appreciate you watching. I also appreciate you sharing so other people can watch too. Be considerate of other people. Let them know how great my videos are. As always, I hope that you have a great day.